a couple of things before we get started. Firstly, thank you to all the sponsors for this event. Can we get a round of applause, please? And secondly, my talk today comes with a big content warning. We're going to be talking about COVID. We're going to be talking about death rates. We're going to be talking about infection rates. And if that makes you feel uncomfortable for any reason, if you don't want to be here, if you're just sick of talking about coronavirus, please feel free to leave. There's no judgment. Nobody's going to care. All right. With that out of the way, welcome to the Dr. Bloomfield Fan Club Hour. <laughs> Um, seriously though, I wanted to talk about something a little bit different today. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about hacking and security vulnerabilities and making sure your apps are secure, but I want to talk a little bit further down the process. I want to talk about what we do when something goes wrong. If you were upstairs just before, you'll know about how important it is to have an incident response plan, and that's what I want to talk about today. But specifically, I want to talk about these numbers. So if we have a look here, you can see that New Zealand's doing pretty well in its COVID infections. We are down to, what, two or three a day? America has 200,000 new infections a day. We're doing pretty good. And there's a lot of people who say, cool, New Zealand is a small island nation of a few million people in the middle of nowhere. Of course it's easy for them to be doing well. Of course it's easy to restrict your borders. And like, yes, we do have an advantage in our remoteness, but I think that it's more than that. I think it's more than where we were. It's a lot more about how our government handled the incident response. And so let's take a little bit of a deeper look at how we did that. We did it blamelessly. We said there's no blame or shame in contracting this virus. The virus is the problem, not the people. And this quote really stood out to me because it just reminded me so much about what I do day to day. We don't point the fingers at the people who make the mistakes. We look at the systems, we look at the processes in place, and we are kind to each other. And that's the important part, right? It's about being kind and it's about understanding. So let's take New Zealand's COVID response and look at it as a perfect example of a blameless incident response. So hi, my name's Sarah, in case you haven't met me. Uh, I work for a search solutions company um, but my opinions are my own and do not reflect those of my employers. And let's face it, Twilight Sparkle will forever be my pony. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want. Uh, it's TS Dubs, but I should warn you, it's mostly just photos of my cat. Like, come for the incident response, stay for the cat. <laughs> uh, and disclaimer, I'm not actually a security professional. I'm a DevOps, but if your DevOps doesn't include security, we're not going to be very good friends. Sorry. All right. So what is this blamelessness thing that I keep talking about? It's a cultural movement. It's assuming people can do the, are doing the best they can with the information available to them at the time. It's about assuming good intent, or at least not assuming malice, as we say. Um, it's about balancing safety and accountability and acknowledging that people can make mistakes. And people do make mistakes, but it's no one person's fault. There should be systems in place to catch these mistakes. And what we're actually looking at is the systems. We're not pointing fingers at people. We're not assigning blame to people. We're not making people feel bad. We're just talking about how we can do better. Um, a system doesn't just have one point of failure. It's not about whose fault it is. It's about where the gaps are. And if people think they're going to be blamed for their mistakes, they don't come out and reveal them, and you don't know what's going wrong, and it happens again. I'm not going to stand up here and like lecture you about how effective blamelessness is because that's a totally different talk. And there's a lot of research on this topic already. Feel free to look up a lot of the Google research. Project Aristotle is a great one. Um, but I do just want to acknowledge a really cool effect that happens when you adopt a blameless culture. You end up with this sort of context of, hey, it's like, why didn't this person enable MFA? It's not because they're stupid. It's because your MFA recommended app isn't accessible to blind people. It's like, hey, why didn't this person use a password manager? Oh, turns out they do use a password manager, but your like, password policy internally doesn't match up what the website says, so they've gone around it, made their own website, and there you go. So it just, it's about increasing the safety of the system and looking at why people do what they do. And we call these the second stories. This is what happens when you remove the human factor and look at the system as a whole. It's about processes and tools, and it's not about human accidents. And this is where the learning really begins. You go, hey, RMFA is not accessible to blind people. Maybe we should look at a different solution. 
hey, we don't want this to happen again. What I want to talk about is New Zealand's COVID response as an example of this approach. It's a perfect example of a blameless incident response process, and it's a case study in blamelessness. There's a few factors that meant that our COVID response went as well as it did, and it's not just because we're a tiny remote island in the middle of nowhere, at least in my opinion. So let's look at what we did during our first infection. Let's look at what happened after that, and let's look at our plans into the future. So first things first, good incident response requires good communication. Amongst your team who are fighting the fire, to your stakeholders within the company, to your clients and users outside of the company, we did pretty well communicating to our people. Let's take a look when we very first went into our first lockdown. So we had our first positive case on the 20th of February this time last year. Please correct me if I got that date wrong. Uh, three weeks after the first occurrence, we had our level alert system. One, two, three, and four. And if I stand up here and say, cool, New Zealand's going into alert level three, you all know exactly what I'm talking about, right? It means that restaurants are closed, stay at home, you can order takeaways if you want, you can go to the supermarket, but that's about it, right? Similarly, if I say alert level two, it means restaurants are open, but they have limited seating, it means there's extra precautions in place. It's, there's very clear criteria for moving between levels, it's about whether or not we have community transmission and how many people have been affected by that. And across everything, there's one source of truth, covid19.gov.nz. Like, it's real easy. I got most of these like facts and pictures from the COVID website, and everything's in the one place. It's about that really clear communication and clear systems and repeating the message. Similarly, we did daily updates. When we first went into level four, which was, what, March 20-something, uh, we started doing updates every day at one o'clock. We put our leaders straight out in front, Jacinda and Ashley, and we said, hey, here's what's going on today. We're gonna to follow the same format. We're gonna give you an update on numbers. We're gonna give you an update on processes. And then we're gonna have Q&A time. It was really simple. It was really straightforward. And we knew what to expect. And I don't know like, if anyone else was tuning in for the Jacinda show every day at 1 p.m. I don't know how many people were like following season two, but <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Uh, but like under it all, we had one very clear, concise message at the end of every alert act like you already have COVID. And that's pretty straightforward, right? Act like you're already infected, act like you can go out and infect other people, be mindful. See, at the core of it all is one thing, it's empathy. It's putting yourself in front of other people and it's just so fundamental to a blameless approach. When it goes wrong, it's because we're, we aren't all in the same boat, we aren't all on the same page, we aren't all doing the same things and we aren't thinking about each other. Everyone just wants to do a good job. When we blame people, they put up walls, they defend themselves, it separates us, it causes divides, and we start creating silos. So in your organization, when you start pointing fingers, you start creating those silos, and you start creating splits between teams. Blamelessness and empathy go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other, and they just work together. New Zealand showed that empathy through every single one of its announcements. Every single thing, don't blame the people, blame the virus. <laughs> it all comes down to that one thing, right? We're all in this together. We're a team of five million. We're doing it together. We didn't even consider going for a herd immunity approach because the deaths of New Zealanders was not an option. And that's what it comes down to. We had 25 deaths in total. Just let that sink in for a second. It was this attitude, this like team building exercise and this empathy we showed for each other that was what increased our compliance and it's what got us to where we are today. You have to praise people who do the right thing. You have to reinforce how important it is when they do the right thing and you don't tell people off when they're not, when they're doing something wrong. We didn't fire the specific minister who went out for a bike ride that he shouldn't have. We didn't blame people who got sick. We didn't point the fingers at people coming in and where they were coming from. Everything was anonymous and that was the point. The next thing you have to do is not focus on root cause. We did this the best during our second outbreak here in Auckland, if you all remember. There was like one family in South Auckland that tested positive and we had no idea how they got it. And so we went straight back to level three. What we didn't do is demand to know where it came from. We didn't go and 
say, hey, how the fuck did you get sick? What did you do wrong? We didn't point the finger and we definitely didn't name and shame that person publicly. What we did do is focus on how to stop it getting any worse. And that's the important part, right? We didn't say, hey, here's this person, here's their name, and like, if you went anywhere near them, like, don't do that. We did do some research on genomic sequencing to try and figure out like, where it could possibly have come from and how we could possibly have got there. But I don't think we ever got an answer to that. I don't think we ever found out how the team in South Auckland got infected, but that's not the point. <laughs> the point was that we went, cool, we've clearly got a vector somewhere, let's look at it and do better. We didn't ignore the fact that there was a failure, but we didn't waste time trying to figure it out. Also, I want to point out, that's a cert pin. He's a fan of ours, too. <laughs> we moved really fast. Uh, we got the news at like 9 p.m. on a Tuesday night, and we went straight back to level three that next day, at least up here in Auckland we did. And you see, the thing is we had a run book, we had a plan, we knew how to do this. We had a clear alert system, we all knew what we were doing, and the prime minister stood up and said, Hey team, we've done this before, we know what we're doing, and it meant that we could go fast and we didn't have to stop and think about diagnostics, we just did the thing. And finally, there was no stigma, right? There's no shame in having the virus, it encouraged people to go and get tested and it meant that we had increased compliance because no one felt bad about the fact that they were sick, they just went and did it. Um, we had subsidies for people out of work, we didn't force people to resign, <laughs> we didn't point the finger. But that doesn't mean we didn't have no accountability. Uh, take the Mount Roskill mini cluster at the church that happened in lockdown too. Um, but what was vilified here were the actions that they took, right? It was a small group of people who met without a mask and thought that would be okay. But at no point did we say, hey, those people are bad. We said, hey, this is a bad action. Don't do this. It wasn't the people who were in trouble. It was the accountability. Like, blamelessness doesn't mean people aren't accountable. It means do better. And don't disappoint Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we looked into the future. We said, cool, let's take what we've learned and let's adapt to it. Uh, the best example of this was our mask rules. If you remember when sort of COVID a year ago, when it was first a thing, and nobody wanted to wear a mask because it was bad and there was a lot of, do we get one, do we not get one? There were a lot of weird misinformation floating around. And as we discovered, masks do help minimize the spread, right? <laughs> especially if you're already infected, stops you infecting other people. And so we adapted those laws. We said, cool, time to start wearing masks if you go outside. There were signs on buses like, please wear a mask. And eventually it became mandatory to wear them on public transport, at least here in Auckland, and if you're taking a flight anywhere. There's a really interesting like social dynamic that came out of this, at least that I noticed. Suddenly you step on a bus and like, if there's sort of three people wearing a mask out of, you know, 20, you suddenly feel like the odd one out for not wearing one. Like, I don't know if anyone else felt this, but it was interesting to me that it only took about 10% of the people wearing a mask to suddenly feel like you were doing the wrong thing and feel like that social pressure to do it, but maybe that was just me. We also increased our testing numbers because testing and detection worked. And the reason people were willing to go out and get a test is because no one felt bad about doing it. We had stronger testing in our borders and we increased them everywhere else. Here in Auckland, they, like every time there's a new community case, they open a testing center like right outside my house. And I imagine a lot of people are in a similar boat, like suddenly there's testing centers everywhere. And because we were blameless and because we encouraged people to go and do it, we encouraged to stay home, get a test if you have symptoms, keep this in mind, then more people were willing to do it. Here's some numbers for you because I'm a numbers person, I don't know about you. We have done one and a half million total tests to date, and the highest number of tests on any one day was 25,000. That's 25,000 Kiwis who all went, hmm, let's be safe, let's go out, let's make sure everyone's okay, let's think about other people first, let's be empathetic. Finally, we, as we were learning, we thought, cool, let's adapt. We started making compassionate exemptions for people to go to funerals, have bigger like gatherings for the dead. We started saying, cool, you can skip your managed isolation if you need to go to a funeral, let's make that happen so that you're not gonna expose everyone else. Let's be kind to the bus drivers. Like here in Auckland, there's signs on all the buses that say, hey, your driver may not be wearing a mask, please be considerate anyway. Like, that's the thing, we were, 
we were kind and we learnt and we found ways around it. And we're still improving today. Um, it wouldn't be a DevOps talk if I didn't talk about continuous improvement. <laughs> we're still getting stricter on mask usage all the time, especially up here. We're investigating and closing down MIQ facilities that have breaches. The info to the public is being released faster and faster. Every time we have a community case, it takes less and less time to update that page. And it's because everyone's using the app. And it, the only criticism I have of this overall approach is that every time I see one of those tweets that says, hey, COVID press announcement at 3 p.m., I have that feeling in my gut like when the pager goes off. <laughs> I don't know if, if that's just me, but it's that moment of, oh no, what's happened, what's wrong, ah. And most of the time it's nothing, but one thing that maybe they should change. Speaking of contract tracing, it works. This was the thing that I think we made the biggest improvement on during our response system. Uh, when the very first lockdown happened, there were like five of these different tracing apps and there was Ripple and there was something else and like none of it was unified. You had to have a bunch of different apps on your phone and you had to have a bunch of different passwords. It was really confusing. And then eventually we kind of came out with, cool, here's our app. Here's the one unified system and every business has to print out a QR code and everybody knows how to use it and everybody signs into it and it makes things really easy. We've even iterated on that. Uh, when you first signed up to it, you had to enter a password that was like 10 characters and two letters and a capital and whatever else. I don't know, I remember my password manager not liking it. But, you know, we've made that easier and you don't get logged out all the time. Speaking of, download the app, turn on Bluetooth, sign into every room during the conference today, please. It's open source, you can go and look at it at the um, at GitHub there. And yeah, here's some numbers, because again, I like numbers. Two and a half million of us have registered on the app. That's half the country. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good time. We've generated almost half a million QR codes, and we're at 176 million scans so far. Uh, the highest number of scans in one day was two and a half million on the 4th of September. I don't remember what happened on the 4th of September, but like, if anyone knows, please let me know, because I'm fascinated. Uh, but let's see if we can break that today by everyone scanning into the room as you come in. <laughs> cool. So what was the impact of all this? I mean, you can see it right there, right? Other countries who did it the blameful way and pointed at other countries for getting them sick or people who were doing the wrong thing and presidents who threw people under the bus <laughs> and closed CDCs. And all of this resulted in a very different story in other places around the world. And because we were blameless, because we were empathetic, because we had compliance, we managed to get this under control. And it means that we're all here today, in person, enjoying an actual security conference. We learned, and we moved quickly, and we got better. So how do we do it here as security professionals? How do we take this, these lessons we've learned and this blamelessness and apply it to our own work? It takes practice. I have an exercise for a friend in the room. Remember when we went to level four the first time? Remember when, for people on the stream, remember when your country first locked down and it was just you and maybe your family and you were stuck at home and we didn't know what was going on? It was really scary, right? Like, I was stuck with my partner and my cat and it was still the hardest 72 days of my life. And yes, I counted. It was really rough, right? And I imagine that it's, Everyone has a different experience, but, you know, we were all scared. We didn't know what was going to happen. Now imagine that you spent 36 hours flying to get home. And you get home, and you get thrown in an unfamiliar room for two weeks without your creature comforts of your cat or your TV or your PlayStation or whatever it is that makes you happy. And all you want is a V and a pie. <laughs> Think about that, and now maybe you can understand why people escaped managed isolation in the way they did. Remember to accept accountability, but put fault aside and focus on what happens and what needs to be done about it. Not who did it, but why did they do it? Why did someone escape isolation? Remember to ask yourself one very important question. What would Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, Director General of Health, do? <laughs> Treat people with kindness, be honest. Everyone's still human, even 
Dr. Bloomfield can't pronounce place names to save his life. Um, and remember, like, it's those three things, right? Communicate clearly and effectively and quickly. Incidents are very rarely the result of like one person messing up. It's usually a whole system. It's the engineer who wrote the code. It's the QA who didn't test it properly. It's the SRE who put it into deployment. It's the unit test that failed. It's whatever it is, right? It's not one person's mistake. Similar with security breaches. It's not the one person who didn't enable MFA. It's the fact that someone taking over their creds could do it in the first place, right? When you are designing your own incident response process, think about all these things. Think about communication. Communicate clearly and quickly to the people involved, to the stakeholders, to the clients. You can make a severity level system, much like our alert level system. You can close down your borders, i.e. you can stop releases, you can freeze things, you can securely lock things up. And don't focus on a root cause. Distributed systems don't have root causes, but a lot of mitigating factors that cause things to go down. Similarly, like a virus infection, literally, either way, will often have other mitigating factors that worsen it. Um, and finally, adapt. Write a runbook so you know what to do next time. But remember, that's not set in stone. You can improve it. You can test it. You can increase masks. You can do things differently to know. And remember, it's a continuous learning process. Remember to put yourself in other people's shoes. We're all on the same team of five million. And if I can leave you with one message today, if nothing else, please remember, always be kind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. We have a few minutes for questions. Really? <laughs> Nobody? Ah, Raman. How much time did you spend to collect all the expressions? Say it again. How much time did you spend to find the graphics? Or I really don't want to answer that question. <laughs> um, let's just say that like my Google results are a mess. <laughs> it's a weird time. <laughs> Were there any questions from the live stream Slido? Just a second, Roman. He's okay. We'll go to Roman next. Yeah, great, uh, great presentation. Um, I, I just wanted to challenge you a little bit. I, I do believe we need to um, um, look into the root cause. I don't think we need to point fingers. I think there's, there is the difference, but in order to adapt and stay ahead, we need to understand. Um, some of the conditions of basically why we ended up in an incident versus the normal conditions where we are safe. Absolutely. And I yeah. hope you can agree. There is a slight no, difference, no, no. and I, I understand totally. Agree, yeah. It's not about pointing fingers, it's about understanding. Yeah, but I challenge the assumption that there is a root cause at all. Often it's not the one person who forgot to enable MFA, it's the fact that, that one person also had access to the entire admin portal. like. Why? <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. It's not like, yes, root cause is important, but it's not, like I challenge the concept that it is a root. Right. If that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, root cause analysis being in what ways did our safeguards break down yeah. is very different from which person gets fired today. <laughs> and yes, I was working as a contractor in a facility where the manager said, who am I firing today? And then he found out it was a tenured employee whom he couldn't fire. And he said, I'll be in my office. <laughs> I wish that weren't a true story. Any other questions or comments? Then with that, we thank you, Sarah, and please accept this token of our appreciation.